Hi everyone, so today's video is going to be a bit of fun. When I had my pop-up and I had my makeup museum, one of the items there were a group of records and they featured a makeup lesson by Ern Westmore, who was one of the Westmore brothers. And in case you don't know, the Westmore brothers really, and their father, really were the pioneers, at the kings of Hollywood makeup, old Hollywood makeup, so I'm talking like 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, they really kind of set the standard for what the starlets look like and really developed all the techniques that were used for cinema makeup. Um, and they were up against it because lighting and film stock was changing all the time and um, I've always been fascinated by them. So um, I love this record, I love listening to it, and I thought, because so many people ask me, oh, what's on that record? I'd love to hear it. I thought today I would play the makeup section, because there are a few different sections. There's facial exercises, skincare, and makeup. By the way, if you love this one today, just with makeup, then I'll do another video with the, the facial exercises, which are actually fantastic. Over the years, I've collected a lot of the Westmores of Hollywood makeup because they had um, a makeup range that changed throughout the decades, but I've got quite a few of the pieces. And I've also been really, really fortunate and feel very privileged that I, got to know, I've met and got to know the family a little bit, particularly Christiana Benson, who is Ern Westmore's great granddaughter. I, it, in the, on my Instagram actually, in my stories, there's a meeting that we had where she bought me Ern's original makeup case and showed me all the pieces inside. So that was like, wow, I was in heaven. To, I think we can say this, quite safely say. Um, and she's also the family historian, so if you are interested in learning more, then go to the westmoresofhollywood.com. I'll put a link below anyway, and that is the website that she manages, which has loads of history and information about them. So lots of the techniques that they pioneered really have stood the test of time. I mean, the basics are still all there, and sometimes I'm just blown away by how modern and relevant it is today. Sometimes I can see, yeah, of course, techniques have moved on, um, priorities have moved on, products have moved on, technologies moved on, um, but generally a lot of the founding principles really have stood the test of time. The language, however, as you can imagine, has moved on a lot, so um, let's not judge them uh, earn too much for that because it's very much a product of its time, um, but it's definitely interesting it's a lot of fun and I'm going to actually have a makeup lesson now with Ern Westmore. So let's get started. Hello there, this is Ern Westmore from Hollywood. And as you know, beauty is my business. Yes, it's been my job as a director of makeup in Hollywood during this past 40 years to glamorize the stars of the screen and teach women throughout the world how to improve their appearance by emphasizing their good features and minimizing their so-called bad features. I say so-called bad features because that feature which you may think is a bad one is nine times out of 10, the one wonderful feature that can make you a most attractive and beautiful person. Are you looking for more beauty, glamor, and personality? You are? Well, just sit back, relax, and listen. And I'll try to help you to become a more beautiful person. You see, only after I've been able to help every woman across this nation to achieve beauty with glamour and a new personality will I be satisfied and have done my life's job. I want to make another very definite promise to each and every one of you before we get started. And it's simply this. If you will be patient and honest with yourself with respect to your face shape and the problems relating to it, I'll promise you, regardless as to whether you are young, middle-aged, or on the easy side of 50, that you can become a far more attractive person than you ever dreamed possible. Now then, if I've stimulated your interest enough to induce you into becoming more beautiful and attractive, then let's turn to the next page of this glamour graph, and you will see the five basic shapes of face, okay? You know, it's been through the analysis of thousands of faces that it's been determined that these are the five basic shapes of face. 
To know your correct face type is to know how to complement, harmonize, and improve your appearance rather than distort it. The secret of enhancing the natural beauty of the other four basic face shapes is by creating the illusion of an oval shape. You may now ask, why is the oval shape considered the ideal face shape? Well, I like to explain it this way. It's the face that the poets write about, the portrait painters paint, and the sculptures sculpt. They very rarely ever write about, paint or sculpt, the long, thin, narrow face, or the so-called fat, full, round face. As a general rule, it's always been the beautiful oval face. So whilst that is one of the more controversial statements in this makeup lesson to say that the only one face shape is the ideal shape, it's the one that the, you know, the um, poets write about. He's strictly just talking about contouring and highlighting and balancing a face, which is what we call it now. We wouldn't say one face shape. We wouldn't use that language anymore. One of the really good things I find about listening to some of these older recordings, firstly, I'm just fascinated in um, the techniques, but also it really does demonstrate just how far we've come. In terms of not just ideas of beauty, societal ideas of beauty, about women, about ideas of culture, all of these things, it really, you can't believe how far we've actually come. So that's a really, really positive thing, something that I take from these recordings and I really enjoy, but also it is just such a window into the past and um, it's just such a good way to learn about history. Now let's turn to the next page, please, and I will cover the subject of basic coloring. Are you light, medium, or dark? Once you've determined your correct color type, the use of the correct combination of shades of base tone, rouge, lipstick, eyeshadow, and powder is an absolute must. To deviate from this rule can only result in a hodgepodge appearance. Hodgepodge, I have to say, love this expression, might be using it myself in the future. And he's making total sense here. He's saying that your colouring determines the tones of makeup you're going to use. Some will flatter, some not so much. This is something that we all understand a lot more today, especially those of us that love doing makeup and understand makeup and makeup artists. And hodgepodge, love that. Here's a few rules to follow. Your base tone should be one shade darker than your skin tone. Your lipstick, rouge, and nail polish should blend harmoniously. Match your nail polish to your lipstick, never your lipstick to your nail polish. This next subject I want to discuss with you is the first and most important requisite to beauty that I know of. What is it? It has to be skin care and your complexion. I'm sure that each and every one here is desirous of a beautiful, clear, soft, smooth complexion that glows with health and vitality. And it calls for nothing more than sound habits of living and thinking, freedom from negative emotions, such as jealousy, fear, and worry, some exercise, proper care of the skin, a well-balanced diet with plenty of rest and relaxation. Let's turn to the next page, please. And I'll explain to you the wonders and the benefits of base tone foundation. Choose the base tone color that matches your coloring and it will flatter your complexion. Yes, make you look lovelier than you ever dreamed possible. To properly apply your base tone, dot it lightly onto your forehead, nose, chin, cheekbones and jaw, between your nose and upper lip, the front and both sides of your throat and under your chin. If you have any protruding features, remember, do not apply dots to them. Instead, blend over them. Now, I want to give you some blending rules to keep in mind at all times. Number one is to always remember to use an upward, outward circular stroke to distribute your base tone. Number two, to blend and smooth your base tone gently, pat or stipple it with your fingertips. Number three, Always make sure you go completely to the hairline and around your neck. Number four, if your lips are to be made less full than the natural lip line, carry the base tone well down past your natural lip line. Number five, 
Make absolutely sure you apply your bass tone evenly with no lines of demarcation. Proper lighting conditions are a must. Now I want to tell you some of the benefits of corrective makeup for so-called objectionable features. Next page, please. Thank you. So now we're at the basic contour and highlighting theory. With the exception of a large nose and the protruding chin, whatever you want to diminish, you apply a shadow one or two shades darker than your overall base tone. And whatever you want to accentuate or fill out, you use a highlight that is one or two shades lighter than your overall base tone. You can be sure that it will take some patience and practice on your part but the results will be well worth the effort. Now then, if you have a chin that you think too weak looking, or maybe it recedes too much, apply a highlight to it and you'll see a tremendous difference. On the other hand, if your chin protrudes, do not apply a darker shade to it. This would only make it look discolored. Instead, apply a highlight from just below the nose, down and around the mouth to the curve of the chin, as I've indicated the highlight and you will create the illusion of the chin seeming to recede in contrast to the highlighted area above it. If your problem is a double chin, and this I did not illustrate, but wanted you to have the information, you can diminish and help its appearance by applying a darker base tone or shadow over its fullness. Now I want to give you a few words of warning when applying your highlights and shadows. Always remember, it is far better to be oversparing than it is to be overdoing. Now let's turn the page to the next subject, which is the application of cheek rouge. It's a well-known fact that cheek rouge will not only make you look pretty, but it will warm and soften your entire appearance when properly applied. On the other hand, when cheek rouge is applied in a daub or a haphazard manner, it can destroy the very beauty you possess and make you look painted or somewhat clownish. The big mistake that some women make when applying cheek rouge is too much of the wrong color in the wrong place. And these women are not to be condemned for their incorrect application of it. It's simply that they have not been given the reasons why and where they should apply their rouge for their particular shape of face. Let's think back for a moment to the start of this session. Do you remember the type of face you decided was yours? Was it oval, round, or was it square, oblong, or triangle? Here are the do's and don'ts for the distribution of rouge if your face is an oblong, the long, thin, narrow face. If this is your type, don't ever apply rouge in the hollow of your cheeks or down the full length of your face. It will make your face look longer and thinner than it is. So I've actually decided to dip into my vintage collection and I've chosen one of the Westmore blushes that I have. This is a House of Westmore makeup brand and the shade that I've chosen, I have quite a lot of corally ones but I have this beautiful pink shade. So I'm going to use this. Now I wouldn't recommend that you use vintage makeup but I thought this would be fun and I do want to do Earn Justice so I'm going to use their original makeup. To make an oblong face look fuller and less thin, start your rouge just below the pupil of your eye on the highest point of your cheekbone. Then blend it softly up and over the cheekbone to the temple. Rouge, when properly applied, can make you prettier and ever so much more attractive. Please turn to the next page. Thank you. This is a subject that I more than enjoy talking about because First and foremost, beauty lies in the eyes. Bright eyes, soft eyes, roguish eyes, smiling eyes, eyes that shine and eyes that glow like sparks of fire. If a woman is to enhance her natural beauty or create the illusion of beauty through correct eye makeup, there are several important things about them of which she should be reminded before making use of color, pencil, and brush. In the first place, although the nose is the most prominent feature of the face and therefore momentarily commands the attention when people first beat, the eyes take over and command the attention thereafter. They then continue to hold the interest as long as two people are together. This is particularly true when members of the opposite sex meet, especially for the first time. 
Turn to the next page, please, and we'll get started with the first step on eye makeup. With the exception of deep-set eyes, all eyes are enhanced and made to look more attractive with eyeshadow. The most important point to remember at all times is that eyeshadow should always be used sparingly and only on the upper lid. For the most pleasing and natural effect, I like the brown tones and the gray shades, especially for daytime wear. Then if you want a more glamorous and exciting appearance for the evening, and remember, there is a difference between daytime and evening makeup. Try the blues and the greens or any of the other high fashion shades. They have a way of giving you that little extra lift if you need one. Illustrated here, as you can see, are six different pairs of eyes. The well spaced, too close together, too far apart, too prominent, dark circles, and the deep set eyes. Yours will be one of these types. Now then, if you're fortunate enough to have well-spaced eyes, then start the shadow at the lash line and blend it upward and outward, halfway up the eyelid as you see illustrated. And there is, as you can see, a correct area of application if you want to make the most of their appearance. Try to keep in mind that a daub of color just does not constitute beauty and glamour. It's where and how you apply it that makes the big difference. Now let's turn the page and I'll explain to you the importance of an eye line. No matter how small or how large your eyes are, or how they are spaced, all eyes require lining. And the reason for this is that an eye line performs two functions. Number one, it helps to frame and shape the eye. Number two, it backs up your lashes and mascara, giving the lash a much fuller appearance. To draw the line properly and easily, place your index finger at the outer end of your eye, then stretch and hold the skin taut out and away from the eye. Then start the line about a quarter of an inch out from the outside corner of the eye and draw it in toward the center as close to the lash line as possible. Remember to always blend and soften the line with your fingertip or a cotton swab stick. I would like you to pay particular attention to the two eye line illustrations at the bottom of the page. The correct and incorrect eye line, that is the end of the line, always make sure that you turn it up if you want to avoid that sad sack expression. Now let's turn the page to the correct application of face powder. To powder your face correctly is without a doubt the best insurance policy I know of for a long lasting makeup. Start by applying the powder under your eyes first. The next step is to check your eyeshadow and your eye line to make sure that they are blended evenly and smoothly before powdering. If you have any squint or laugh lines, make it a habit to spread them apart and pat the powder into them. Otherwise, they'll become more prominent as the day or evening goes on. You'll find it works wonders. Last and most important rule to remember with respect to powdering is to always pat your powder on. Never rub it or scrub it. To remove the excess of powder, there is nothing that takes the place of a powder brush. To set your makeup so that it will last all day or evening, just dip a few cotton pads into ice cold water and press it to your entire face. You'll find it works wonders. That is such a genius tip, considering how heavy the powdering was that they used to do. So they used to powder everything, as you've seen, mainly because the foundations were very oily and needed so much setting, so you really had to bake them in, because it was still kind of theatrical makeup then. So really just using that cold water, not only does it kind of brighten your face, I guess it's the equivalent of using like a hydrating spray after your makeup now, but it also takes off the top layer of the powder so it means that your skin would look really, really fresh, but it's not enough to disturb the makeup, like there's no makeup coming off. But that is genius. Oh, I might have to steal that tip. That is so good. Now, let's turn the page and I'll show you and tell you how you can locate your eyebrow and determine its length in a very simple way. As a general rule, the brow should start directly above the inside corner of your eye. Then to locate the other end and the length of it, place a pencil on a 45 degree angle from the outside corner of the eye up to where it crosses the natural brow line. This is where the brow should end. To locate the highest point or arch of the brow, 
place a dot on a direct line with the outside of the iris of your eye. On the next page coming up, you will see very clearly as I explain to you the five very simple steps to a beautifully defined eyebrow. This, of course, can only be done after you have powdered. The surface must be dry. First, we brush the brow clean, then brush the brow hairs up. Next, we apply the fine hair stroke lines where they are needed to fill out and shape the brow. For the most natural effect, I use two shades of pencil when making up a pair of brows. A darker tone for the top of the brow and a lighter shade for the bottom. Try it and you'll see what I mean. That's it for the eyebrow pencils. Now let's turn the page to the application of mascara. Thank you. So the brow that I followed from the guide was the brow for a bigger eye and Ern recommended that I drew it lower than normal. So that's what I've done. Um, and I totally agree with the two pencils, although using the dark at the top and the light in the bottom is maybe, probably worked then because people did have thinner eyebrows so you could kind of make that transition a bit more whereas now well it depends what your brow is but with mine it would be better to kind of mix up those those colors um, which is what I did but I also agree with what he said the bit I didn't play was that he said most people shouldn't use a black eyebrow pencil because he's seen many a makeup ruined by a black eyebrow pencil and I have to say I agree so on to mascara and I'm I've got lots of original mascaras from this time. I'm not actually going to use them because I don't want to get any issues with my eyes. But I am going to use this brush because I've always wanted to try this tiny little Maybelline brush. So I'm going to use this but dipped into regular mascara, modern mascara. Step number one is that your lashes must be thoroughly cleaned with a water-soaked cotton swab stick if your mascara is to last and look beautiful all day or evening. When applying your mascara, regardless of the type that you use, always apply it in an upward and outward stroke from the base of the lash to the tip. Mascara your upper lashes only, never the lower, unless they are blonde. And remember that stroke, upward and outward. Now, the best reason that I can think of for the use of mascara is that it beautifies and emphasizes your eyes. Without it, your eyes are unframed. So, interestingly enough, no mascara on the lower lashes and no eyeshadow on the lower lashes. So, this is something that we probably find quite strange now because that's kind of what we do. I mean, we don't have to, but you very often do use mascara on the lower lashes. I think it's just very of its time. If you think of all of those Hollywood starlets, it was a very sort of heavy eye look, especially like Greta Garbo and then Marilyn Monroe being inspired by Greta Garbo. And that was very much about the sort of almost doe eyes, that very kind of sleepy eye look. And um, it was just something that was really popular at the time. <laughs> Yes, it's your lips. But before I get started on how to make your lips more beautiful, there's something I'd like to explain to some of you that may be of some help, because there are a great many women who wonder why their lips become thin and drooping as time goes by. Well, whether you like it or not, as you think, so shall you mold the shape of your mouth. If your thoughts are constantly mean, selfish, and discouraged, your mouth and expression takes on a downward droop. Then there's the woman with the attitude of, oh, well, I don't care. I'll just have to do the best I can. This is a negative martyr attitude that will also pull down the corners of your mouth, giving you an unhappy lip line. And unless you do something about it, every little disappointment and heartache will take its toll in the expression of your lips. But you could start today to prevent it and reclaim the beauty of your lips if you will just follow this suggestion. Whenever you feel your face and lips becoming strained and drooping, try thinking with a smile and it will pull up the corners of your mouth. Just that little lifting of your lips will lift your spirits and make life in general look ever so much brighter. Turn the page, please, and we will show the ladies 
how to create their new and beautiful lip lines. To ascertain as to whether your mouth is of ideal proportions, that is, too wide or too narrow, all you need do is to smile and hold a pencil on a direct line with the pupil of your eye. If the corners of your mouth when smiling are the same distance apart as the pupils of your eyes, then your mouth is of ideal proportion. A mouth that is too narrow or small should be extended. The mouth that is too wide should be made to look smaller, and this can only be done with a lip brush, as you will see later on. How many times have you wished that you could make up your lips as beautifully as Miss So-and-so? Well, you can, and all you'll have to do is learn to use a lip brush correctly. As I've said a thousand and one times, if you can write your name with a pencil, you can write beauty onto your lips with a lip brush. And here's the simple way to do it. After you have filled the bristles of the brush with lipstick, place your elbow on your dressing table to steady your arm, then your little finger on your chin to steady your hand. You're ready for action. To draw the outline, start at the center of your upper lip and draw it out toward the corner in one single continuous curved line. Then draw the other side and fill it in. As for the lower lip line, gently close your mouth and press your lips together, and this will give you the correct lower lip line proportions, plus a guide to follow. Now then, draw a short straight line about a half an inch long at the bottom of your lip in the center. Then draw a soft full curve from the outer corners down to the short line. Fill it in, and I'm sure that you'll be pleasantly surprised with the results. Your lips must be thoroughly dry when you apply your lipstick if you want it to stay on and last longer and look prettier than it ever has before. So that technique definitely would take a little bit of practice and I didn't quite get it right, as you can see. Doing the top lip in one go, I'm just not used to that, but I can see that you could get, it, it, it could work. But I, now I'm gonna have to do my corrections as well. Actually, I'm gonna listen to, I'm gonna listen to Ern's corrections. Turn to the next page, please, and I'll show the ladies how to correct lip shapes with a lip brush. As you can see here, I have illustrated very graphically how you can correct your so-called disproportioned lips with just a little willingness, time, practice, patience, and a lip brush. If your lips are too thin, then follow the corrective procedure as I have illustrated it at the top of the page. A moment ago, I spoke about the mouth that was too small or too narrow. The second graph indicates the way to extend it, to give it a more beautiful, ideal proportion. If your lips droop, I'm sure that you must look older than you really are with a downhearted, unhappy expression. So why not change it by following the illustrated instructions for drooping lips? The lip line that is irregular, that is, higher on one side than the other, produces the effect of the know-it-all wise guy type of person, even in the face of the fact that you may be the sweetest person in the world. So why not tie your sweet personality and your lip line together by raising the low side and lowering the high side with a lip brush. To remove the excess of lipstick, your lips must be blotted with a folded tissue. Then to absorb the excess on the inside and the corners of the lip, Fold a clean tissue and bite it, making sure that every time you bite or blot, you use a clean surface of the tissue. And above all, make it a habit to wear lipstick from the moment you get up in the morning until you turn the light out at night. Now then, let's turn the page and I'll tell you all of the do's and don'ts for each one of the five basic shapes of face. Now, let's look at Miss Oblong on the next page. This is Miss Oblong, the long, thin, narrow face. And here are the don'ts for it. Don't apply rouge in the hollow of your cheeks. And don't use a high arch lip or brow line because these two mistakes could make your face look longer than it is. Now for the do's. To add width to the upper part of the oblong face, create a softly curved horizontal brow line and be sure to use fine hair stroke lines when you apply it. 
As for your cheek rouge, apply it to the highest point of your cheekbones and then blend it back up to the temple. Now that you know the basic fundamentals to follow, you may, if you wish, apply the fad or fashion of the day to them. All of these techniques were created and developed by my brothers and myself. So that's the finished look. Wasn't that fantastic? I literally feel like I've been in a time machine. Um, it totally transported me back to that time. Please do let me know what you think in the comments. I'd love to hear your take on it. And um, there is another set of records which are more about facial exercises and skincare, and they're just amazing. So if you would like to see that as a video, let me know in the comments and um, I'll do that too. So over to you, Mr. Westmore, to see us out of this tutorial. This is Ern Westmore, and I sincerely do trust that I have helped each and every one of you in some small way to become a more beautiful person. Thank you, thank you again.